Hello, welcome to a new lecture of Math S401 Dynamic Optimization. Today we're going to continue our study of the uh, Bellman uh, fixed point uh, value function. And we're going to focus on the properties of differentiability and then we're going to make the connection with Euler equations. Okay. However, before we continue, I'm going to give a, a quick um, uh, introduction or, or a quick elaboration on concave functions, because this will become important when we uh, prove several results. So let me consider a domain X, which can be a subset, let's say, of, of RK. And then we're going to consider a function, let me call this function V, that goes from X to R, so it's a reevaluate function. I'm going to assume that it's continuous. And concave okay so these are the, are the uh, assumption I'm going to impose concavity so if I draw this in special case where uh, x is a subset of R then I can draw a concave function V so normally you draw something that looks like this right it's hump shaped and it's uh, smooth however this is not the only possible concave function in fact, it doesn't have to be smooth like this. I can also have a concave function that has a kink. All right, so one kink or possibly many kinks. Okay, so this is a this is a, a second possibility of having a concave function. Okay. So anyway, if I have a, a concave function, how can I see that it's a concave function? Well, for any point. Let me take it x0 that I can draw. I can draw the gradient or the, the I can call it a supporting hyperplane or the tangent. If I draw the tangent and this at this uh, point here, it's entirely uh, above the function. Okay. And I can do the same thing here, right? So even if I have a kink, I can draw a tangent line. It's not really a tangent line, but I can then draw a line that goes through this point, okay, and is entirely above, above this thing uh, here. And you can show that it's actually uh, a feature of concave functions that define uh, concavity. Okay. So let me try to express this in, in a mathematical way, right? So what does it mean for this line to be entirely above the function? Well, it means that for any other x that I take, if I compare this value, right, which is v of x, and I compare this value, which we're going to, to pinpoint in a minute, then this value has to be less or equal to this. Uh, this value has to be less or equal to this value. Okay, and here the same thing. For any other x in the domain, vx has to be less or equal to uh, this value here. Okay. And I forgot to say it here. Let's assume that this is a convex set uh, for simplicity okay so what does this mean well this means that I can draw a line okay and let me assume that this line has slope delta okay so in general if x is in rk then delta will be also a vector in rk right it's the slope of this hyperplane above the function okay so if v is concave okay then for all x0 and x I can find the delta in Rn okay so this delta might depend on x right because for different x uh, zeros I have different uh, lines or different slopes okay such that for all x and x v of x right which is this point here is less or equal to this point here okay and what's this point well it's v of x zero plus something okay which is this uh, if i have x zero here it's basically this uh, distance here okay so it's less or equal to v zero and this distance is delta times 
x minus x zero. And this is the dot product. Okay. So this here is the equation of uh, of this tangent line here. Okay. Or is the equation of this line here? Okay. So, in fact. I say that if V is concave, then this assumption holds, but you can show that this is an F and only if condition. Okay. So basically, uh, you have a concave function, if and only if I can, at every point, I can draw this kind of line. And here you also see that if, uh, if I take x to be equal to x0, then of course V of x0 is less or equal to, this becomes 0, this becomes V of x0. Okay which is uh, obviously true. Okay. Good. Then, in addition to this, we would like to make a distinction between functions that have a kink and functions that don't have a kink. Okay? And we would like to somehow express it in, in terms of this uh, condition. So let me consider a function that has a kink. So what's, what's particular about this uh, situation is that, indeed, I can draw a tangent line okay, through this point, such that the entire function is below uh, this line. But I can draw many of them. Okay, I can draw this one, this one, this one, and so on. So this means that the delta is not unique. Right? So if I have a kink, then the delta is not unique. I can draw many different lines with many different uh, slopes, and all of these will satisfy this condition. However, if I draw a concave function uh, that's smooth, right, so it's differentiable, then if I draw this tangent line, I can only draw one of them. Okay. If I draw another one, it will cross this uh, function, so it's not entirely above the uh, function okay so if the concave function is c1 differentiable then delta is unique okay and actually you can show the if and only if condition right so if at if we have that vx for all x and x v x minus or less or equal to v x zero plus delta x minus x zero and delta is unique right so there's only one delta that satisfies this for every x okay and you can show that v is c1 at x zero okay so this picture graph shows that if, if the concave function is c1 differentiable there's only a unique delta right it's the slope of this hyperplane if there's only one unique line that's tangent then it's also c1 okay so this is an if and only if uh, condition and you can actually prove this the proof is not so difficult but i will leave it uh, maybe as a homework okay so these are some ingredients that we need in order to uh, progress on the main question of today. And the main, uh, we're going to do this by giving a lemma, and this is called the Benvenist Scheichmann lemma. I hope I write it correctly, their names. And this is the following. And it's actually a quite easy consequence of uh, what we have uh, said before. So let's have a, a set X, which is a subset of, let's say, RK, which is convex. I have a function V from X to R that's continuous and concave. I have a function, let's say, also W from x to r that's continuous concave and c1 at x0 
epsilon point x0. So uh, here we assume that x0 is in the interior of x. Okay, so the derivative, if x0 is at the boundary, well, the, there's, uh, there's a problem that there's no uh, unique derivative. Okay, so this is why we, we assume that it's in the interior. And then I have two important conditions. Well, the first one is that at x0, w is equal to v. Okay, and for all x in the domain, w x is less or equal to v of x. Okay. Well, if these conditions are all satisfied, okay, so we have two functions that are concave. This one is simply concave. This one is concave, but differentiable at x to zero. The functions are identical at x zero and at all other points, v is at least as big as w. Well, then we have that v is c1 at x zero. So it's differentiable at x zero. And the second condition is that if I look at the gradient of w at x0, then it's equal to the derivative or gradient of v at x0. I, I should not put c1 because c1 means differentiable and continuous uh, differentiable. I should simply say differentiable. Okay, so v is differentiable and the derivative of v at x0 is equal to the derivative of w at x0. And in order to understand, uh, it's easy, probably easier intuitive to draw a picture. Okay, so let this be x. Then I have a w. At x0, there's a derivative, unique derivative, so there's a unique hyperplane here. Okay. And now I am required to draw a function, v, which is greater or equal to w, right? So it should lie above this function w. It should go through this point, right? Because this is wx0, which is equal to vx0. Okay, this is the second condition, and it's concave, right? So if I... I'm asked to draw a concave function uh, that satisfies this condition. Maybe it looks something like this. But it's impossible for me to draw this function having a kink at this point. Right? Because if I would have a kink at this point, well, then I somehow have to be below the function w, which is not allowed. Okay? So this is the idea behind the dilemma. So if there's a v doesn't have a kink at this point, and then of course it's differentiable and you have a derivative and the, the derivative will be equal to the slope of this uh, tangent line, say delta, so the derivative of w and v at x0 are identical. Okay. So the proof is the following. So take any x In x, well, then I have that wx minus wx0. Well, w of x is less or equal to v of x. Okay, and w of x0 is equal to v of x0. So I have this inequality holding for all x. Okay, and then because v is differentiable, I can for example, v is this function, right? I can find a tangent line with some slope delta, and then this has to satisfy that this is less or equal to delta times x minus x zero, okay? So v is concave, then there exists a delta in Rn. That satisfies this uh, condition, okay? This is simply this condition where I put v x0 to the other side. Okay. Well then, because I have this inequality, I have that w of x minus w of x0 is also less or equal to delta x minus x0. 
for all x. Okay, here x was arbitrary, so for all x I have this here. So this means that if I draw w at x0, then this delta corresponds to the slope of this hyperplane, which is uh, tangent at x0. Okay, because of uh, this if and only if condition. Okay, so this means that delta is equal to the derivative of w at x0. And we know because w is differentiable at x0, there is only one such delta. Okay, and because there's only one such delta that satisfies this, there's only one such delta that satisfies uh, this inequality here. Okay. So there's a unique delta such that you, such that for all x and x, v x minus v x zero is less or equal to delta times x minus x0, and if there's only one delta that satisfies this, well then I have that v is differentiable at x0 because of the uniqueness, and of course the derivative of v at x0 is equal to delta, and you already have seen that this is equal to the derivative of x, uh, the derivative of uh, w at x0. And this establishes uh, the proof. Okay, so basically it uses this uh, inequality here. This has to satisfy for some delta because of V is concave, but because W is differentiable, this delta will be unique. And if this delta is unique, then V is also differentiable at X0. Okay, so we're going to use this Ben to Schenkman lemma in order to study the differentiability of the uh, Bellman uh, fixed point uh, function. So remember, we were dealing with the following problem. Vx0 was equal to the maximum of a in g of x of f xa plus beta v a. Okay, and here we have seen that because of the Bellman contraction mapping. This is the v, this fixed point, will be in c phi of x, right? So in particular, it's a continuous function that's bounded in the final. So we know it's continuous. So if, it should not be x0, but simply x. So if x varies a little bit, then v will vary a little bit, right? So that's continuity. But maybe you want to have a stronger assumption. So when is, when is v differentiable at, say, x0 and x. Okay, so this might be the question that we would like to answer. So we would like to see if there's a stronger assumption satisfied on this v, namely differentiability. Okay. And I'm going to give the theorem, and the theorem is going to use or rely on the Ben Venice de Schenkman lemma. So this is why you have seen it uh, before. So the theorem is the following. So I'm going to take the problem x, f, g, beta, and I'm going to assume that it's regular. Okay, so it satisfies all the assumptions for the Bellman equation to hold and to give the same solution as the infinite horizon optimization problem. Okay, that's uh, regularity. And then I'm going to impose some assumptions that we have seen in the previous lecture. In particular, I'm going to assume that f is strictly concave. Um, right, I'm going to assume that g is convex. So remember what this means. This means that if x0 and x1 is in x and a0 is in g of x0, a1 is in g of x1, then convex combination alpha a0 plus 1 minus alpha a1 is in g of alpha x0 plus 
one minus alpha x1 okay so from the previous lecture we have seen if these two conditions are satisfied well then the v uh, the Bellman fixed point is strictly concave okay and I have a policy function which is continuous okay so this falls by strict concavity if I solve this problem I will have a unique solution this unique solution will give me a continuous function that says at every x what's the best thing to do okay so this is just repetition of the previous uh, lecture. So now we're going to assume some additional conditions. And these are the following. So assume at <coughs> x0 that gamma of x0, right, which is the best thing to do at uh, a certain state x0, is in this is in g of x0, but we're going to assume that it's in fact an element in the interior of g of x0. Okay, so what does this mean? This means that it doesn't, the best thing to do is not going to be on the boundary of this feasible set of actions. And I'm going to assume that x0 is also in the interior uh, of the state space. Okay, so in general, if I have a maybe my uh, g correspondence looks like this i have an x0 which is in the interior right so it's i can find a ball of radius epsilon that's entirely included in x and then my gamma of x0 which should, should be somewhere here is not on the boundary but is somewhere in the interior okay so i can also draw a ball of radius epsilon around this value such that it's entirely inside uh, g of x0. Okay, so this is an assumption that I'm going to make. And then I'm also going to assume that <coughs> f, which goes from x to x to r, right, which is an uh, instantaneous uh, objective function, is uh, differentiable. Okay, so these are two additional assumptions that I'm going to make. Interiorness of the policy function, right, and differentiability of f. And then the theorem says the following, well, if all these conditions are satisfied, then v is differentiable at x0, and the derivative of v at x0 is equal to the derivative of f at x0 when the state tomorrow is gamma of x0. Okay, so here, what does this mean? This means that f has two arguments. I'm taking here the derivative with respect to the first argument, keeping the second argument fixed. Okay. So this is uh, important. So if these are two scalars, well, basically what you do is you take the derivative of f with respect to the first argument, and then you have x0 gamma x0. Okay, so this is um, what we have. So we have that v is differentiable, and the derivative is equal uh, to this. And this is also known as the envelope theorem. Okay, so for the proof, so what are we going to do? Well, we're going to use the Ben Venister Shankman theorem, and we're going to use a function v and use the function w, specify it, see that all the assumptions are satisfied, then we're going to take the derivative of w with respect to x0, and we're going to put it equal to the derivative of v at x0. Okay. So in particular here, v will be my Bellman value function v, okay? And w will be uh, a little bit different. 
<clears throat> so first of all we know that gamma of x is zero all right so let me give this a special name let me make this a zero okay i know that this is in the interior of g of x zero okay so i have here some x zero i have here gamma of x zero something like this so if this is true then given the conditions on g that we have imposed well in particular we have assumed that it's continuous upper and lower and you have assumed that it's convex okay well if this is true then i can you can basically show that i can draw a neighborhood open neighborhood around x zero right such that for every point in this neighborhood this value right a zero is still in g of x for every x okay so let me write it down so there exists neighborhood let me call it d of x zero right so a convex maybe instead of a neighborhood i can say there exists an epsilon bigger than zero uh, such that for all x in b epsilon x zero so this is the ball of radius epsilon around x zero right so for every state in this ball of radius epsilon around zero i have that a zero which is the optimal thing to do at x zero it's also in g of x okay so this is basically what this picture shows i can find a radius epsilon such that for anything that's epsilon close to x zero a zero is still a feasible action to take okay so this is something that i will need i will not prove this fact uh, the proof is a bit uh, elaborate and not so uh, doesn't add anything to the understanding but just trust me that <coughs> this is possible and now i'm going to define w so w is going to go from the set to r and it's given by the following expression so w of x is equal to f x a zero plus beta v e zero Okay, so what do we do? You fix a0 here and here, and this is x, so w only varies with x. Okay, so if you compare this to uh, v of x, which is equal to the value function v, well, this is equal to the maximum of a in g of x of fx a plus b v a. Okay. So this keeps a0 fixed at the optimal value at x0. <coughs> the v takes the maximum of all feasible actions. Okay. So because a0 is in g of x, right? This is what we had here. I know that this <coughs> will be less or equal to this one here. Okay, because this is the optimal one and this is a feasible one because of this and this is. Uh, has been established here okay so i know that for all x and ball of radius epsilon around x zero w of x is less or equal to v of x and second if i put x zero in this expression well because a zero is equal to the best thing i can do i know that let me write it here, v of x0 is equal to f of x0, a0 plus beta, v of a0, All right? And this is equal to w of x0, All right? If I plug in x0 here, I have an x0 here. So I also know that w of x0 is equal to v of x0, All right? So these are two conditions that need to be satisfied for ben veniste shankman theorem. Okay, so I already have this. <clears throat> Next, I also need concavity, but that's easy because 
uh, this is a fixed number for w and this is a concave function okay so this is concave and I also know that v is concave right and continuous this is also continuous because f is continuous All right so the only thing that you need to show now is that w is differentiable at x0 but this is easy because we assume that f is differentiable right so if i take the derivative of this at x0 let me write the function again here so i have w of x is equal to f x a0 plus beta v a0 sorry so if i take the derivative of this function with respect to x which is the argument well then i have that this is equal to the gradient of f x a0 okay and by the van venister shankman theorem i know that this is equal to the derivative of v at x0 okay this should be at x0 okay so this demonstrates the proof uh, that v is differentiable at x0 and the derivative is equal to uh, this thing here so let me give you an example okay so let's go back to the ak model that you have seen before so remember uh, we chose a sequence of consumption amounts to maximize discounted uh, utility subject to um, kt plus 1 is equal to a kt minus ct and then k0 given okay from this we obtained the Bellman equation which was in terms of k so this was uh, vk is equal to the maximum of c between 0 and a k of uc plus beta v a k minus c okay this was the Bellman equation and then uh, you can basically uh, substitute out or to the change of variables define k equal to a k minus c which is a state in the next period okay and this gives you vk is equal to the maximum k tilde which also between 0 and a k of u a k minus k tilde plus beta v k tilde okay so this is in the form uh, that we started with uh, in this lecture right this is this is in this uh, kind of form where the action that you choose is actually the state tomorrow right so here i'm choosing the capital stock tomorrow so this is in uh, this form so if i want to use this if i want to uh, look at differentiability of this function then there's a few things that need to be satisfied right for example let me um i need to have that u is strictly concave i need that this correspondence is convex but that's uh, not so difficult right because if this is the line ak Right, so this is the correspondence, and if I take two points in this correspondence, then obviously it will be uh, everything on the line segment between these two points is also in the correspondence. Okay, so this is convex. It's upper heme continuous and lower heme continuous. We have seen that under some conditions this is a regular problem, right? So all these uh, conditions together imply that this is V is concave, right? Now, in order for this v to be differentiable 
there's a certain couple of things that need to be satisfied. The first thing that needs to be satisfied is that the maximum here will be reached at the point k tilde strictly between 0 and ak. Okay, so I cannot hit the 0 or the upper limit when I'm computing this maximum. Okay, so k tilde is So the optimal k tilde has to be in an in, in interior point. And I think that's the biggest restriction of this uh, framework. So if k tilde is really interior, then basically this constraint uh, is not binding. So I can omit it from the problem. Okay. So then I have the following problem that vk is equal to the maximum of k tilde. I can omit the restriction, right, of u a k minus k tilde plus beta v k tilde okay so now i can use uh, the theorem that you have just proven in order to get the derivative of the value function so the derivative of v let me denote it by v prime well this will be equal to remember The derivative of f with respect to the state not the the action and here f is equal to u okay so this will be equal to u of a k minus k tilde and then the chain rule i will have a, a multiplier a here okay because i'm taking the derivative with respect to this and then i'm evaluating it at k tilde the one that uh, maximizes this problem Okay, so let me write this as k tilde star. Okay. So this is a bit of a all annoying notation. So what one does in practice is one uses sub uh, indices t. So v at state kt is equal to maximum. So I'm choosing kt plus 1 to maximize u a kt minus kt plus 1 plus beta v kt plus 1 okay and then v prime of kt will be equal to the derivative of the utility function at a kt minus kt plus 1 uh, times a okay so what's the use of this well in principle you can use it to derive the Euler equations so let's uh, do this. Well, I'm maximizing this problem, right? And I know that this is concave continuous differentiable. Now I know that this is uh, concave and differentiable, right? If all the interior conditions are satisfied, so I can take the first order condition to solve this. And if I take the derivative with respect to kt plus one of this objective function and set it equal to zero, I get that u of a kt minus kt plus 1 and then the chain rule I have a minus here plus beta v derivative of kt plus 1 is equal to 0 okay so I have this condition from the envelope theorem and I have this condition from the first order condition okay so this is the envelope theorem and this is the first order condition and you can see that we still have the value function or the derivative of the value function in here and in here. And in order to get rid of this, it's not so difficult. So this is the derivative of v at kt plus 1. This is the derivative of v at kt. But this holds for every t, right? So it also holds for kt plus 1. So if I just um, progress one period, this gives me v, the derivative of v with respect to kt plus 1 is equal to derivative of the utility function of a k t plus one now all right minus k t plus two times a okay and now we can substitute this into this so i have that minus u prime of a k t minus k t plus one plus beta derivative of u with respect to a kt plus 1 minus 
kt plus 2 times a is equal to 0. This is equal to my consumption at period t. This is equal to my consumption at period t plus 1. So simplified, this says that if I put this to the other side, that the marginal utility of consumption at period t is equal to beta times a times the marginal utility at consumption at period t plus 1. And this is normally the Euler equation uh, the Euler equation uh, for the intertemporal dynamic optimization problem, okay? So using the envelope theorem and the first order conditions, subject to all the list of conditions that we have imposed, basically gets you to this uh, optimization problem, right? Or this condition that gives you a um, law of motion, basically it tells you how CT plus one should be if I have CT, right? Or kt plus 1 gives you kt plus 1 and kt plus 2 in terms of kt. Okay, so this, in terms of the state, I have 1, 2, 3 periods, right? So I have an equation that has to satisfy it for 3 consecutive periods. The state of the action variable, I have something in the action of tomorrow that has to be a function of the action today. All right, so... Let's continue with the study of these Euler equations. Uh, so previously we have seen how to obtain Euler equations from the envelope theorem and the first order conditions. There's a more heuristic approach to immediately see where these Euler equations come from. And this is simply to go back to the infinite horizon model, right? So we have uh, beta to the power t of fx t xd plus 1. Okay, this is the objective function that you would like to maximize by using x1, x2, and so on, right, and x0 is given. And xd is in g of x t minus 1. All right, so assume that we have, we have a solution to this problem. We have previously seen what kind of list of conditions has to be set aside in order to obtain a solution, but assume that we have a solution. So we're going to denote the solution by x1 star, x2 star, and so on. xt star. Okay, so this is an infinite list of states. That's feasible, and if I plug this in into the objective function, it will maximize it. Okay, so now let me take this part here. Right, and let me take the optimal values until t minus 1. And then let me, I'm allowed to vary the x at period t, but then at period t plus 1, I have to stick again to the optimal path. Okay, so this is like a variation on the problem where I relax the constraint on xt but I keep the optimal path before period t and after period t. Okay, so if I plug this into the objective function, I get the following problem. First, I go to, to period, uh, right, let me write it down. So I have f x is zero, which is fixed, right? So it's also optimal. x1 plus beta f x1 x2 and so on until beta t minus 1 f x t minus 1 which is the optimal and then x t right this is the one I, I allow to vary plus beta t f x t x t plus 1 and then beta t plus 1 f x t plus 1 x t plus 2 and so on okay so basically i write this infinite sum explicitly uh, here and then if i have 
plot like this, then of course I need to have the, the two additional constraints that xt is in g xt minus 1, xt minus 1 is optimal, and xt plus 1 is in g of xt. Okay. Now, this is uh, basically the optimal solution where I allow the variable xt to take on different values than the optimal one. Okay. So I know that if I maximize this with respect to xt, which is the only thing that's allowed to change here, then the solution will be x star t. Okay, I will maximize this at the value of x star t. Why? Because x star t is the maximum, is the optimal solution. Right? It's basically the optimal solution of this uh, problem, which is less constrained than this one. So if I fix all the values at the optimal one except for one, and I look at this uh, perturbed problem, I will have the optimal solution at uh, x star t. Okay. So if these two constraints are not binding okay, at the optimum, this is again this interior uh, solution condition that we had before, and if f is concave, then basically what we can do is we can take first order conditions with respect to xt, and we know that they have to be zero at this uh, particular value. Okay, so let's try to do this. Well, this is all fixed, right? I only have an xt here, so this becomes bt minus one f with respect to the second argument so let me call this f2 this is derivative of f with respect to the second argument at xt now at the optimal value uh, xt minus one sorry at the optimal value xt plus and there's an x here beta to the power t f now the derivative with respect to the first argument of xt at the optimal value xt plus 1 and this should be equal to 0. Okay, I can divide both sides by beta to the power t minus 1 and I get the condition that f2 at xt minus 1 xt plus beta times f1 at the value xt xt plus 1 is equal to 0. Okay, and this thing here this is also the Euler equation. Okay, so this shows that under the differentiability assumption, if the solutions are interior, then the Euler equation should be satisfied, right? If the function f is concave. This is uh, basically what, what has been shown here. It's not at all sure that these equations are also sufficient to have an optimal solution. Okay, and this is something that we will address now. Okay, so so far we have seen that under some conditions the Euler equations are necessary. Now let me put a list of conditions such that uh, Euler equations are also sufficient to have the optimal solution. <clears throat> so, as before we have a problem. X if g um, beta, right, we can assume it's regular so that uh, all the smoothness conditions and the boundedness conditions are satisfied. So we're going to assume several things. Well, first of all, f is going to be concave and differentiable. And let me also assume that x is equal to subset of r, right? So I'm looking at states here in the space r to make my life easier. So I'm going to assume that f is concave and differentiable. I'm going to assume that the derivative of f with respect to the first argument is greater or equal to zero. And basically I'm also going to limit this to subset of r plus, right? So all states are non-negative. So all states are greater or equal to zero. Okay. And then I'm going to assume that I have a, a sequence of x1, 
x2 xt and so on right so i have a part of states such that xt is in g of xt minus one okay maybe i can start my part at x0 which is fixed okay so i have a part starting at x0 that's feasible right so every state is in g of the of the previous state that's okay and then i have that the euler equation is also satisfied in the sense that f2 of xt xt plus 1 plus beta times the first derivative of f of xt plus 1 uh, this one sorry i always miss the t indices xt minus 1 xt plus beta f1 xt xt plus 1 this is zero. all right so i have a part that's feasible and my part satisfies the order equation and then i have a another condition and this is called a transversality condition and transversality condition basically puts a requirement on what happens in the limit so here i'm going to assume that if the limit of t going to infinity of beta to the power t of f1 xt xt plus 1 times xt that this is equal to zero okay i can also require that this is less or equal to zero because this is non negative this is non negative uh, by assumption and this is also non negative by assumption right so if this limit is less or equal to zero then it's equal to zero okay so this is another assumption i'm going to, to assume so basically this says that because this goes approaches to zero if t goes to infinity this basically says that these two here, this product, uh, cannot go to infinity faster than beta goes to zero. Okay, so it's uh, some kind of boundedness on on the states and the gradient of the objective function at infinity. All right, so if all of these conditions are satisfied, right? So I have a part that satisfies the transversality condition that's feasible, then. Uh, I can show that x0, x1, xt, and so on is optimal in the sense that it maximizes uh, this infinite horizon optimization problem. Okay. Now, not with the stars. Okay, so in that this maximizes this intertemporal uh, infinite horizon optimization problem if all of these conditions are satisfied. So the proof is a uh, quite a bit of notation, but it's not uh, very difficult. So let x zero, right? So I'm going to start at the same point, right? Because I forgot to say. Here we assume that x0 is given. Okay. So let x0, x1, x2, xt, and so on be a feasible path. Right? So this means that xt is in g of x t minus 1 for all t. Okay? And basically, what we want to show is that. The infinite sum of beta to the power t of f x t star x t plus one that this is greater or equal to the infinite sum of beta to the power t of f x t x t plus one. Okay, because this we want to show that this is optimal and this is a feasible part, so this is another uh, value of the problem. And this is uh, basically how the proof is going to work. This is what we're going to show. Okay. So let's first look at 
the problem from t0 to t of the difference between this side and this side. So we have um, f x t x t plus one minus f x t x t plus one, and then this beta to the power t. Okay, and now I'm going to use concavity. All right, so remember, if I have a concave function, then v x minus v x prime is less or equal to. Then now I have the gradient of v at x star times x minus x star. Okay, so here this was my my delta. If you remember at the beginning of the lecture, but if v is differentiable, there's only one delta and it's equal to the to the gradient of, of this uh, function. So this is what I'm going to use here. So I need a gradient of f. I have two. Here my, my dimension is two dimensional, so I have a gradient of f at the first, I have a uh, derivative of f at the second uh, part here. So first, I'm copy beta to the power t, and then I'm taking the derivative of f with respect to the first argument at x star t x star t plus 1 and then I have to multiply it with, by x t minus x t star okay and then plus t 0 to t of beta to the power t and now the derivative with respect to the second argument f2 x t x t plus 1 and then xt plus 1 minus xt plus 1 star. Okay, so far so good. So let me split up this sum into period 0 and then period 1 to t. Okay, so this is equal for in period 0, I have beta to the power 0 of f1 x star 0 x star 1 and then here my path starts at period 0 at x star 0 right these two paths start at the same value of x0 minus x star 0 and then I have the sum from t equal to 1 to t of beta to the power t of f1 x star t x star t plus 1 xt minus x star t and then copying this f2 of x star t x star t plus 1 and then xt plus 1 minus x star t plus 1 okay and why do i do this well because this is of course they start at the same uh, state so this is equal to zero so the first term here disappears okay and now I use for the next step I'm going to use the Euler equation here right so f1 uh, f2 no let me take f1 right f1 here is equal to minus f2 divided by beta okay so the first here becomes the sum from t equal to 1 to t of beta to the power t but then i divide by beta so this becomes beta to the power t minus 1 of f2 and now i have to look at the indexes so if i have xt xt plus 1 this becomes xt minus 1 xt so f2 of x star t minus 1 xt of xt minus x star t and then i have the sum from t equal to 0 to t of beta to the power t f2 xt x star t plus 1 and then x t plus 1 minus x star t plus 1 
So here I have something minus f2, here I have f2, so we would like these to cancel out. And it's possible to cancel out because this goes from t1 to t and this goes from t0 to t, right? So first of all, we have to change the index, not running from 1 to t, but running from 0 to uh, t minus 1. And we're going to do this by a change of uh, index, a change of variables, you could say. So if t is equal to 1, I want, let me call this uh, j. So j is going to be equal to t minus t minus 1, right? Or t is equal to j plus 1, which is the same thing, okay? So this is going to be equal to the sum. If t is equal to 1, then j is equal to 0, right? So this runs from j 0. If t is equal to big T, then j is equal to capital T minus 1, right? So I'm running from j 0 to t minus 1. Of beta, now t minus 1 is equal to j, so beta to the power j. And then f2 of x star t minus 1 is j, t is j plus 1, so this x star j plus 1. And then I'm left with x j plus 1 minus x star j plus 1. And I forgot the minus sign in front. And then I have a sum from t equal to 0 to t of beta to the power t f2 x star t x star t plus 1 x t plus 1 minus x star t. So these two things are the same, except that here I'm going from 0 to t minus 1 and here I'm going from 0 to t. All right, so if, if I take this uh, difference, I'm left with only one term, which is the last term here. All right, so this is beta to the power t of f2 x star t x star t plus 1 x t plus 1 minus x star t. All right, I have an f2. I can make this an f1 by using the Euler uh, equation once more. Right, so I have that f2 xt xt plus 1 is equal to beta times f1 x. Uh, now I have to look because I'm basically changing indices, right? So f2 t minus 1 t, so this becomes f2 t t plus 1 becomes beta f1 and then t plus 1 t plus 2. Okay. So this becomes beta to the power t, and then I have a beta from f1, so this is t plus 1, of f1 x star, now t plus 1 x star t plus 2, and then I have x t plus 1 minus x t uh, plus 1. I forgot the plus 1 here. Okay. And a plus one here. And with a minus sign. Okay. So this is minus beta t plus one f one x star t plus one x star t plus two times x t plus one and then minus minus this becomes a plus beta t plus one f one x t plus 1, x star t plus 2, times x star t plus 1. Okay, so f1 is greater or equal to 0, x t plus 1 is greater or equal to 0, because we assume that all x's are greater or equal to 0, this is greater or equal to 0, so this entire thing here is less or equal to 0, alright? So I know that this is less or equal to 0, uh, less or equal than beta t plus 1 f1 x star t plus 1 I should have made this all these are all capital T's okay because I'm looking at the last periods um, sorry for the sloppy notation 
Okay, so these are all capital T's. This is capital T. This is a capital T. This is also capital T. So x star t plus 1, x star t plus 2, times x star t plus 1. Okay, so in the end, uh, remember where I started from. I had the, the problem t equal to 0 um, to t of f xt xt plus 1 to the power of beta t minus t0 to t of beta to the power t f x star t x star t plus 1 then I had a sequence of derivations with some less than or equal uh, signs in between so I have that this difference here is less or equal to beta t plus 1 f1 x star t plus 1 x star t plus 2 times x star t plus 1 okay and I would like this to be less or equal to 0 when t goes to infinity however if I take the limit from t to infinity then I can take the limit from t to infinity here and then by the transversality condition here I know that this here converges for t going to infinity to, to 0 <coughs> sorry okay so this goes to 0 which means that in the limit uh, this here is greater or equal to this one so indeed uh, the sequence of states that satisfy all these conditions or the Euler equation uh, together with the transversality condition indeed is optimal okay so this concludes uh, the part on Euler equations thank you for watching